interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We take you now to Washington. The details are not available. They will be in a few minutes. The White House is now giving out a statement. The attack apparently was made on all naval and on naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. The president's brief statement was read to reporters by Stephen Early, the president's secretary. A Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor naturally would mean war. Such an attack would naturally bring a counterattack, and hostilities of this kind would naturally mean that the president would ask Congress for a declaration of war. There is no doubt from the temper of Congress that such a declaration oh, yeah. would be granted. This morning, Secretary Hull talked with the secretaries of war and of the Navy. Now the two special Japanese envoys, Admiral Nomura and Special Envoy Caruso, are, are at the State Department engaged in conference with Secretary of State Hull. Their appearance at the State Department on this Sunday afternoon emphasizes the gravity of the Far Eastern situation where hostilities now seem to be actually opening over the whole South Pacific. And just now comes the word from the President's office that a second air attack has been reported on Army and Navy bases in Manila. Thus, we have official announcements from the White House that Japanese airplanes have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and have now attacked Army and Navy bases in Manila. We return you now to New York and we'll give you later information as it comes along from the White House. We return you now to New York. Okay, well, they're not going to return you to New York. Hi, this is Jeff Williams in uh, White Bear Lake, Minnesota at our studios at Suburban Community Channels. You are watching North Star Oasis, and we thank you for joining us today. Uh, that was the um, real-time, well, that's the bro uh, one of the broadcasts that was played on the afternoon of December 7th, 1941, when it was known that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. That occurred 74 years ago this past Monday. And I wanted to start off the show with that because I think it's important that we go back and we look at the way people receive the news that um, and you know we are actually recording the show and do you know what day that we're doing this recording December 7th yes on this Monday uh, we had a couple of schedule changes that came up and we felt that it was just much easier for us to record uh, you know, the show, and we did it on December 7th um, for playback when you're watching it, you know, now today on uh, December 12th. But yes, we are actually recording this show on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and we wanted to bring you that flavor of the breaking news because that's what it was like back in 1941 when people were listening to the radios. They really didn't have too many people have TV sets, but you know a lot, a lot of radios out, and it was breaking news. This is what's happening, and when we pause to reflect what happened 74 years ago, that we wanted to bring that right up to the forefront because today's show is all about Pearl Harbor. We were in a the staff here. We were in a tremendous position. Uh, back on March 4th, when our videographer and producer, uh, Dallas Pearson, had gone out to cover, at my request, the 100th anniversary of the Naval Reserve. And at the ceremony that was held, we met a gentleman named Dick Phil from St. Paul. And he is the last, or one of the last, survivors of the USS Ward. He's a Pearl Harbor survivor. And we sat down for, I think it was about two and a half hours with him on, uh, that, the, on that evening at his home. He uh, was kind enough to bring us in. And so we wanted to give you, on you know, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, you know, 
the experience that we had of talking to uh, Mr. Phil because he really tells an incredible story. So we're actually just going to show you the first part right now. Well, I was born in St. Paul out on West 7th Street area in the old Anchor Hospital, which is out near the uh, uh, brewery out there. They, uh, and so I, but I lived on the west side uh, all my life. Uh, <clears throat> I lived over on near Stryker Avenue and Winifred Street, and uh, we lived there until I was about five years old, and then we moved up to uh, Baker Street, 152 West Baker Street, and it's between Bidwell and Bevels, and it's still in in uh, St. Paul, but it's w the west side. So, and then uh, of course, <clears throat> that's where I was living when I joined the reserve, and of course the reserve was on the, on the, basically on the west side because it's right underneath the Wabasha Street Bridge, and uh, and. <clears throat> And I always thought I'd like to have one of those navy white hats, you know, white cap. I was 16 years old, and that was a big deal, you know. And back in those days in the 30s, why uh, you didn't have anything, so something like that would be cool to have. We thought. So uh, I, my dad worked for the Northern States Power Company, and he had a, uh, a fellow that belonged to the Naval Reserve that worked in his area. So I asked him if he couldn't get the, uh, one of those white hats for me. And the uh, off officer came back from uh, to my dad and he said, well, no, we can't give any clothes away like that, but if you join the Naval Reserve, you get the whole uniform. So <laughs> we thought that was a pretty tricky. So my dad signed a paper saying I was uh, 17 years old and uh, uh, we joined up. So what year was that that you had joined? Uh, 1940. Okay. But it was in the latter part of the 1940, the last part. So, and that was uh, after I joined up. Why well, they gave me all my clothes and you had to stencil them all. To, uh, every all piece of your clothing had to have your name stenciled on it. And and then in uh, in October, let's see. You know, August, I guess it was, I went on, the, on a two-week cruise uh, for the Naval Reserve up on Lake, uh, well, we went down to uh, uh, the Great Lakes, and they were on a, a little boat down there, they called it a gunboat, but it was an old old uh, ship owned, uh, owned by some personal people, and they used it for training. And uh, so the 47th Division is what I belonged to at uh, the Naval Reserve. And I spent two weeks on that cruise, and they went to Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and then we came back from Lake Superior. And William Warden got back, uh, and uh, we got the word that uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was declared a national emergency and the Naval Reserve was going to go on a one-year uh, tour now on. But he said uh, because it's near Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, he'd wait until after the holidays. So we didn't leave until uh, uh, January 21st of 1941. Of 1941. And we took a train down to uh, to, to California, and uh, it was in uh, down to where the uh, tra what they called the Navy um, in what, San Diego. San Diego, yeah. San, I don't know why I have trouble with that, but they, that's where they had their Navy base there, and uh, it was all for and that's where they had all these. Uh, old ships that they had built in World War I, old four-stack destroyers. They built wow. like 250 of them for World War I. And that was the U.S. West Ward was one of those. Okay. So they were taking, the, they had them all lined up there to, and uh, rusting away, you know, for 22 years. And then they decided to uh, put us in action again. So. They, we scraped all the rust off of that thing and put red lead on it and and painted it up and got it all set to go. So in February of uh, of 41, 
uh, was launched and re recommissioned. The unit I was in, we all stuck together. There were uh, 84 of us, and 84 enlisted men and two officers. And we just we went all in, all on a train, went down to, the, to California, and we stuck together there. And of course, that didn't make up the whole crew. There were about 10 regular Navy men uh, brought in, onto the crew, and there were about 10 or so uh, uh, guys who had been retired from the Navy, uh, fleet reserves they called them, and they activated them and put them on the ship too. And they were all older guys, all tattoos all over the place. <laughs> this was something different. And then made up a crew of about a hundred and about 140, no, not 40, 120, about 125 uh, crew. And so they get that put together. And we went up to uh, Mare Island to get uh, equipment. And uh, Mare, Mare Island is where? That's in uh, California. California. Yeah, that's where, actually, that's where the ship was built back in 1940. Uh, for, uh, I can't remember when it was. was way back when that's where it started. And the ship was built in 17 days, which was a, a record. Wow. They had a guy that knew how to, he did with the, instead of just laying the, 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 uh, the thing down and building the thing there piece by piece, why they had built it up in pieces in different sections and put it together and then they brought the pieces over and they built that, put it all together in 17 days. Wow. It was a world's record or something. Uh, uh, so that was very unique, but that was a, all done, of course, a long time ago. How tall was it? Uh, I don't know. It, I know one thing, it had a uh, look. Uh, we didn't have a, uh, uh, radar and stuff in those days. We had to climb an open rung ladder uh, to a lookout wow. station up. Uh, uh, crow's uh, Nest? Uh, yeah, Crow's Nest, and we were the crows. Uh -huh. An open rung ladder, and that thing was 60 feet above the water line. And boy, I, I, you got up there, and it was really up, and it moved when the ship rolled. And you, it was like being in a carnival uh, wow. ride, waving back and forth, and then it would hit a wave, it would shudder. It was tough. It was dangerous to go up there. So it took us about nine days to get to Hawaii, and then we were very glad to get there. So then we were the 80th Destroyer Division. There were four, three other uh, destroyers, old ones, just like ours down there. So we were that 80th Destroyer Division, and our job was to patrol. Uh, we'd each take a week uh, patrolling the uh, area just outside of the harbor mouth. Okay. There's a Four, uh, two square mile area where the, the people aren't, the local people aren't in there, they, they can't go in there to fish or anything like that. And that we would just do lazy eights in there and uh, wait, people had to check in and out. Our, our, our submarines had to come in on the surface and they had to leave on the surface to, to get out till they get out beyond that point. And, uh, and then every morning, uh, about two o'clock in the morning, or between, two, there would be a four minesweepers would come out of the uh, Pearl Harbor, and they'd sweep the area every morning, even though it's peacetime. They'd sweep that, and make sure there weren't any mines laid in there. And they, they had seen actually one of their uh, uh, ships had seen a, a uh, uh, periscope coming through the water about four o'clock in the morning. Wow! And we were called to, and we were on patrol. The ward was on patrol, and we had to uh, go over there and try and find out what where it was going. He said the uh, the uh, periscope was headed toward the entrance to the harbor, so we went over there. Well, it's two in the morning, and it was not very good visibility, so we never saw anything there. But at uh, at about six, a little after six, not quite six thirty. Uh, the, this uh, uh, at the entrance to the harbor, they have a net across there. It's not an anti-submarine net, but it's an anti-torpedo net. Okay. Because uh, the the entrance to the harbor is gives you a clean shot at the, where the uh, 
the uh, battleships were lined up inside the harbor, not far in there. Okay. So they had that. And the Japanese were smart enough to build these midget submarines because they know that the water in Pearl Harbor is only about 42 feet deep. So they had to have something less than that. Uh, and they were going to follow our ships uh, in there. And we didn't know that the uh, mother ships, the mother submarines, there were five of them were carrying these little baby submarines. Wow. And there, they, but these so-called midget submarines are about 80 feet long and they're only six feet in diameter and they have only two men and two torpedoes. And they're just a long uh, tube. So uh, <clears throat> they, they, two of them actually got in there uh, through uh, no fault, I don't know why. They just were smart enough to get in there. But anyway, they got in there. And it takes 40 minutes to open up that uh, net that, for, that seals off the harbor. It takes about 40 minutes to open it and close it again. So when one of our ships would go in, they would follow one of them in there. And, and there okay. were, there were well, it didn't draw much water, so they could get in there unnoticed. But this one happened to be, the one we saw, happened to be following uh, one of our ships that were, was going in. And uh, we were one, it was quite a ways behind it. And we couldn't figure out what it was because it's, it, the, the conning tower is only big enough for two men to be in it. And of course, it, not very, it wasn't up in the air very high either. And so we were wondering why, uh, what's this thing? We thought it was a, a, something fell, got loose and was floating down there. But uh, it was a, at the same time, there was a PBY plane that flies around the island uh, checking to see that there's nobody making you know, illegal alien uh, landings there. And, it would, and, uh, and the Coast Guard also has uh, a uh, Coast Guard cutter goes around the island every day too to make sure that, uh, that they do a lot of that. Because you can't just come and land on on Oahu and without permission. And so. Yeah. so could you describe a typical, before December 7th, just what, what your typical day was like when you were on duty? You know, from my understanding that in uh, Pearl Harbor and, and really in Hawaii, it, it wasn't the tourist destination that it is now and that there was just really not a lot there. That's what I've yeah. heard from some others who were stationed there before yeah. World War II. Well, it, w it wasn't, uh, <clears throat> they didn't have much there. In fact, is while we were there, they built a uh, theater to go to, that uh, mm -hmm. was a thing to do. But, and they had a YMCA, Army and Navy YMCA, where they could go, a lot of the sailors would go ashore, and they'd get a, a locker in the YMCA, and they'd change the civilian clothes. And then they, they could, you know, the, the Navy wouldn't get blamed for all the trouble that started. Because <laughs> they, their main goal was to go drink beer and have a good time, you know. But, uh, but they, uh, they had that the theater opened up, and that was nice. But uh, there was, people went to the beach, and they went swimming, and there was things to do. The weather was fine. You could go up in the mountains. You could take tours around the island for $5. You could you'd take a tour, with a, like a cab or something, go around the island. And uh, a lot of people did that. There were a lot of things to see, and it was, uh, it was good to go on the beach. And, uh, and outside of that, it was, uh, people went to, uh, Go have a good time, I guess. So now, but the uh, there was the only people that came there of uh, any notoriety were movie stars. The movie stars used to come, and they'd, oh, they'd get the word that there would be a movie star. So did you ever meet Clark Gable? No, no, no. no but we saw uh, we saw one gal there. What was her name? She was I can't remember her name right now. Dog on it. But she was a very famous lady movie star. She was there. We saw Sar, you know. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but that was about it. That was the big excitement to have a movie star there. But they only had two, uh, two hotels. The uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel was very famous. That's where all the movie stars and rich people stayed. And that had a nice beach and stuff. And then there was one other hotel that was right on the main street there. Uh, but that was nice too, but that was at two hotels, so. Wow. And the rest were all uh, places, that, they had a place called uh, 
uh, they can't remember right now, I know I could forget it. It was a beer joint to go to that was very popular for the Navy guys to go to. Yeah, and it used to cost uh, 50 cents to take a cab from the Navy from Pearl Harbor into town. 50 cents. That was a lot of money for us because we were only getting, getting, I was only getting like $21 a month. Wow, that is a lot. Yeah, and because I was a minor, you had to send $10 home to your parents. <laughs> but uh, the popular drink in those days was the Cuba Libra. That was just uh, because they liked, uh, it was like a uh, uh, little, little uh, whiskey in, in a uh, Coca-Cola. Okay. Because <laughs> so, we really liked the Coca-Cola, but we wanted to be the men, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happens a lot of times, yeah. So now, from the time Reveille started to the time you were done for, with the day, on an average work day, what was what was that like? Can you walk us through that? Well, you just uh, you got to, had to get up in the morning early, and uh, of course you had to, they had to stand uh, watches. They kept they had a they had somebody and, uh, uh, right at the uh, the boats would go out. Well, you had to have some boat crews available, so you needed a, a, a sailor for to be the bow man, and you needed a uh, guy to run the motor, and then you need the coxswain to steer it. So there's three men on there. They have to be on duty too, and they have to change every so often, and they take people back and forth, and captains would sometimes go ashore. They had their own uh, boat, their own boat crew. Uh, but otherwise it was just uh, scraping, wire brushing, getting the rust off, painting. And you did a lot of scraping and wire brushing. And it, it, that's what the crews did. And the people that were in the engine rooms where they had work to do down there too. So, they, uh, so it was just they had chores to do. And of course, they have to clean the ship and paint it mm -hmm. and everything. And and of course, the cooks uh, they get up at three o'clock in the morning and they had to get the, the light off their. Uh, so, stoves. what was your duty assignment? Were, did, well, did, did did they give you ratings back then? Yeah. And what were you rated as? A second class seaman. Okay. That was the base. See, when we were at the uh, at. St. Paul, we were apprentice seamen, mm -hmm. but they can't put apprentice seamen on active duty. So when we went on active duty, we okay. all got promoted to second class seamen. And then, and then I was, I was a, uh, studying to be a, a typing, uh, what, uh, uh, in, and uh, I was good at that in high school, and uh, that would be the uh, what do they call that again? Clerk. Well, it's it's the guy that's. Did they do all the typing and everything? It's, uh, and uh, I was um, trying to be that, but that position was already filled. So uh -huh. they said, well, they have a, a, a job called the Jack of the Dust. Every ship has it. It's an assigned duty by an officer, and he, he assigned you the duty, and your job is to take care of all the places that store the food. So the, it's all canned, a lot of canned food, and uh, you had to be down in the hold when they brought all the stores on board. You had to stack it where you wanted it so you could find it again. And the, uh, the, the sugar come in hundred pound bags, the flour in forty pound, eighty pound bags, and the coffee in sixty pound bags. Wow! And I was only one hundred and thirty two pounds, and I had to, and of course the the galley was in the midships. And that store one was way at the stern. Oh, <laughs> and and I had to know where that was. And then they had a big refrigerator mounted right on the weather deck on top. That kept all the and the food, the meat used to come in, in quarters in those days. They didn't have it all cut in little pieces mm -hmm. later. Uh, and later on, after the war started, all the meat came already cut in small pieces and in boxes, so they could store a lot of it better. And they. Because they, uh, on the weather deck, they had a butcher block okay. uh, welded right to the deck. And uh, we'd get like chickens that come with their heads and their feet on, but they'd have the, they'd have the already plucked, and uh, they'd have the gizzards would be stored inside and they were frozen. Well, the jack of the dust, he had to take care of that. He had to do the butchering. 
and he had to and he had to take care of that. So when he get these uh, chickens, where the, the uh, people that sold chickens really made money on that thing, mm -hmm. we'd have to cut the head off and cut the feet off, and then pull some of the feathers that they missed off of there, and open up, take the uh, gizzards out because we could use that to make gravy and things like that. So you had to do those things. So that's what the Jack of the Dust was. And my name, and you get the nickname Dusty, comes with that. And I never was called anything and for five years, five and a half years, but Dusty <laughs> was the only name I would respond to. So that happened like that. So people were learning how to be torpedo men and how to be uh, uh, signal men and, uh, and uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, you have to learn your job, is what it is. But you do a lot of paint scraping and, and, and painting and that. Yeah. And then you had the drills. You had the drills to, for, uh, to get the general quarters. Everybody, even the cooks had a, I was a sight setter on a four inch gun, like the one they okay. got down there. And uh, here you have the phones on and you get the orders from the, uh, from the uh, oh, captain what to do. Like when to load the guns and stuff. And, to do that, so they have to practice that, and they want to get that. There's nine men to a gun crew. Okay. Nine men, and you have to. Uh, they're all at different stations. And at night time, they're probably sleeping. But the idea is, they have to. When that alarm goes off for general quarters, they have to get to that gun within three minutes. That's what they aim for. So you do a lot of practicing with that. They yeah. just practice that all the time. So you probably could do that uh, five or six times a day uh, if they wanted to. And then of course then they have to have fire drills yeah. and uh, some people are told where the, uh, where the hoses are and some people just carry a bucket of sand out to that area. And so what did you carry on your fire drill? Well, I, I didn't have a fire drill station. I was uh, at, uh, in the galley of course okay. and the uh, cooks have to they have to turn their range off and uh, make sure everything's okay, and then go to your fire go to your fire drill if you had one. And then they had abandoned ship drills, so you had a you were assigned to a boat or a, or some something that would float, and they practiced doing that too. So so they you'd know where to go if you were, were had abandoned ship, you'd go to that station. And that was part one of our interview with um, Dick Phil, Pearl Harbor survivor from the USS Ward. And actually, I was able to find a photograph of Mr. Phil. And if we want to show it on the computer here, this is a wartime photograph of, uh, it looks like he's seen in first class, I believe. So he may have, this may have been a later war photo. Uh, but this is uh, Richard Phil, the gentleman that you were just seeing. Uh, back as he looked 74 years ago during Pearl Harbor. So now we are going to show you another clip about what happened at Pearl Harbor from a news broadcast. From the NBC newsroom in New York, President Roosevelt said in a statement today that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii from the air. I'll repeat that. President Roosevelt says that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii from the air. We will interrupt all programs to give you latest news bulletins. Stay tuned to this station. J-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O puddings. Ladies and gentlemen, a special announcement. The entire regular personnel of the sheriff and police office has been placed on a two-platoon basis with 12-hour shift. All auxiliary personnel has been directed to stand by for emergency service instruction. The regular county defense program is functioning in an orderly manner, and citizens are urged to remain calm and avoid all unnecessary confusion because of hysteria. Citizen volunteers are asked to go quietly to their nearest police or fire stations and offer their services if they wish to help. There is no immediate cause for alarm, and coolness will accomplish more than anything else. We return you now to Hollywood.
know when you visit your grocer's, look at the shelf where you always see those familiar packages of Jell-O. Right beside them, or very near them, you'll spy another Jell-O product. Jell-O puddings in three grand flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. You might try Jell-O butterscotch pudding. It's as smooth as cream and simply full of rich golden butterscotch flavor. A pudding that your whole family will want to enjoy again and again. So when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings, too. They're just like grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Go ahead, Honolulu. Uh, several planes have been shot down, and anti-aircraft gunnery is very heavy. All lines of communication seem to be down between the various army posts. Everyone here on the islands were taken by surprise by the attack, and even yet it's difficult for some people to believe that our air raid on these beautiful islands has actually happened and that lives have been lost. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, several squadrons of Japanese planes came in from the south dropping bombs and incendiary bombs over the city. One bomb dropped in front of the governor's mansion. Traffic is almost at a standstill. At Pearl Harbor, three ships were attacked. The Oklahoma was set afire. There is great activity there now in clearing the debris. The governor has proclaimed a state of emergency. The army has issued orders for all people, the civilian population, to remain off the streets. After machine gunning Fort Island, the first Japanese planes moved to Hickam Field. There were 350 men killed in a direct bomb hit on the barracks at Hickam Field. A bulletin from New York. The Japanese took over the American Shanghai Power and Light Company this morning. This news came hours after the bombing of Honolulu. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> And that was what you heard, would have heard if you were around in 1941 on December 7th. And I will make note that there was a Jell-O commercial in there. Uh, Bill Cosby, who later became a Jell-O spokesman, he was four years old at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was born in July of 1937. Uh, but anyhow, we have a lot more to cover. We are going to go right to our uh, part two of the interview with Dick Phil from the USS Ward. December 6th, well, I came to work, uh, I, I, had, I, came, I had to come to work at 3 o'clock in the morning at, uh, on December 7th. Yeah. Yeah. So I, w I was up at 3 o'clock and in the galley, and then I had to shut the range, just get it started and get it going, and then at about 6 o'clock in the morning, well, then they, we had to shut everything down because we were, well, at 4 o'clock in the morning we had to, went to general quarters. And then we were up there for a couple hours, you know. Then I have to go down and start it all over again. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then at six o'clock in the morning, I shut it down, and go back again. <laughs> so, and I, that's why the galley, uh, the, the galleys in the in the galley in the galley deck house had two guns on top of it, one on the port side and one on the starboard side. The wow. four-inch guns; they were the main two, main guns. And I was a sight setter. On gun number two, which was on the port side, okay. yeah, and the gun number one is up on the bow, and that's the ship is shaped like this, you know. Well, their gun is right in the middle on the forecastle up forward, so they could shoot either to the left or to the right. But it's inboard, and they they can't get the if the target's too close to you, they can't bear down far enough. So when okay. they fired their number one gun. They couldn't get it low enough to hit the target. It was so close. Wow. That's an unusual thing. And the bullet went over the top of the thing. They could see that happen. And then in, uh, the gun number three was on the starboard side of the galley deck house, and that gun is right on the edge, uh, right on the edge of the thing, so they could point it right down practically. But it's too close for a rangefinder to give them any range because for Navy range finding, usually only starts at about 600, 600 yards. Oh. And this thing is way in close. So they had to just kind of 
barrel point the gun at the wow. uh, at the uh, thing, and it worked, and they hit it right in the in the in right in the. Uh, so can you bring us up to events starting from six uh, from 0600 on 7 December? Oh. 0600. Yeah, 0600. Well, we're at uh, General Quarters. Okay. So everybody's at their battle station. And nobody knows what's really going on there because this thing is floating along there with just the conning tower sticking out and it's not very big. So a lot of people thought it's uh, maybe a, some kind of a buoy or something came loose. Then when they could see that con and they could see the telescope the periscope sticking out of the top of it, which was only sticking out about that far above the top of the... Uh, wow, that isn't uh, much. And, and the... Uh, and the conning tower is only about five, six feet tall. So, so it, <clears throat> we saw that, and we didn't know what it was because it had no markings on it, no numbers, wow, and no letters. And there was a PBY plane flying around. It just noticed it. He noticed it. He thought it was probably something that belonged to us and it was in trouble. And he dropped a uh, smoke bomb on it to help us find it. But we already saw it. And we we're going at it. And uh, orders are for anybody in there that doesn't belong in there, they could be fired on even in, in peacetime. Mm -hmm. So our captain had just been captain one day. Wow. <laughs> and he, he took command the day before. And, and he, uh, <clears throat> he thought he was going to ram it. He thought he'd ram this thing because he didn't know what it was. So he kicked it up to 20 knots. And he heads at it, and then he gets to thinking. He tells us this all later afterwards. He tells us, oh, gee, if I do this, I'm going to damage my ship. I'll probably lose my ship. It'll be the shortest command in history, he said. <laughs> but he decided then the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, submarine's going like this, and we're coming at him from this angle, and uh, He's going to ram it. Well, then he decides to go to fire on it. He said, well, fire at it when you load and fire. So they fired at it. Number one gun fired at it from this distance, and they were so close to it that the thing went over. Mm -hmm. And he got back and went right across, right in front of it, and the other gun number four fired backwards at it this way, and they hit it. But okay. we're going 20 knots. The shot is a, a miracle shot. Wow! And, and to hit it right, right, right at the water line. And you were on which gun number? I was on gun number two. I was you on the two. port side. Okay. The action Four's was the all on the on the starboard side. Okay. I don't know why, but they always seem to favor the starboard side for <laughs> taking pictures and everything. But you have to be at your station. You're getting orders. And what's happening? And you have to. Your gun's pointed out that way in case something shows up over there. Mm -hmm. So we have to be at that thing. So anyway, they hit that, and then they looked in. <clears throat> then we're going like this, and then the stern of the ship, they're coming so fast, they're almost hitting us. And then they cross behind where we, we, we go over, and we drop the uh, depth charges off. Okay. For a set at 100 feet. and. Uh, and then they came across and were right over the top of them when those things exploded. They pushed a lot of water up and pushed it around, but didn't do any damage to it because they were down 100 feet. But anyway, the water started coming, the days in there, the bow started to go down. And uh, they probably were dead in there because it was shell landed right in where they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then, of course, this water goes in there, and this is a long, hollow tube. There's no water tight integrity on there, yeah. and uh, you got hole this big, and the, the deeper you get, the more the water squirts. So it filled in, and it went right to the bottom. Well, but on a long circle, they said, thought, because it didn't, because where it was hit isn't where it wasn't where it sunk. It went made a long circle and went out farther. That's what they found out later when wow. they discovered it, because Bob Ballard, you know, Bob Ballard, yeah. he he went down there and had a couple of our crew, and uh, he even had a uh, Japanese uh, uh, submariner captain. Oh, wow. But, and they're, they're all pointing to where we hit it, and the thing really went out out a ways, apparently, because after they found it in 1,200 feet of water, it was out in a little different spot. So, But they did find it. 
and it's just sitting upright down there, and uh, torpedoes still on it, but they don't want anybody touching it because it could be the Japanese have they mine their uh, stuff so that if if they want to bend what after they shoot their uh, torpedoes off, they'll pull up alongside of a ship and then blow themselves up and the ship with it. So they. So what time was that shot? That shot was about, uh, oh, I'd say 6.40 or something like that. Okay. Not exactly sure exactly. But it was, what was happening, it just, then everything, uh, the, nobody wanted to believe that we were shooting at it. The people that were on duty uh, on Sunday said they had all junior officers had to, uh -huh. <laughs> don't want to say, well, they always say, well, why didn't you, you guys shot that an hour before the airplanes came. Why didn't they? Had get all the, all the uh, airplanes ready to go off. Well, the the army had all the planes on the fields. They didn't want to put them out toward the edge of the field because they were mm -hmm. afraid there'd be uh, uh, damage by spies. Yeah, they were put in there. So they of put them out the there. Sabotage. Uh, they had them all lined just nice for the. And then when the planes come, they just boom. Well, they say, well, well, it takes four hours to get these planes all manned. You got to get the guys up, and get it, man them, get to put the ammunition in the guns and all that stuff. You think they'd have it more ready, but uh, they weren't. It takes four hours, so wow. it, it, that's why it was so what. We only shot down. Uh, uh, we I'm not talking about our, our gun. We didn't shoot anybody down. We had two twenty two. Um, Two machine guns on there, and they both jammed up on us. And, they, and they, those planes that had dropped off things, the torpedo planes that had dropped off things, and uh, and uh, some of the some of their fighter planes that were just machine gunning and everything, they fly right over us. They almost knock our crow's nest off. Wow! But our guns are jammed. Now we got we're sitting there. We can't fight, it, shoot anything with the big guns because they're pointing that uh, that direction. And uh, even when they went past, well, it was too late by that time because they and they all went different directions. See, the mm -hmm. the Japanese didn't want to put go back to their ships. They had to tell us where they were. So they're north of us, and and they're. Uh, <clears throat> They're going off, go, turning this way, turning that way. One of them even crash landed on an island down there. Wow! And, and uh, then we had a, a, a um, uh, aircraft, no aircraft carriers inside of the harbor. Yeah. Just battleships and uh, other, all the other type of ships. But there was a, a uh, aircraft carrier coming. They were 200 miles away. But the Japanese are up here, and they're down that way. Wow! And uh, they and they didn't they didn't know what was going on there. Uh, and they uh, what they do before they land, you know, the ship lands. They have 18 planes take off, and they kind of patrol everything out ahead of it. And then one of them came into Pearl Harbor to land, and he's saying he's not. A, and of course, everybody is. Uh, Gun happy by that time. They shot oh. him down. They never did find out what happened. So his plane went down and that. I don't know what's going on. what's going on, you know. Nobody's at that time there's nobody shooting at us. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no marking to tell us who they are. We didn't know they were Japanese. We didn't know that they had twenty six submarines about five miles out in a half circle. We wow. found that out after the war. They got all this cause, and uh and, so uh, was that was they were, a lot of they're just waiting, and so what happened is when the, the J uh, Japanese uh, they sent three hundred and fifty some planes after us at two uh, at a total of two different times. There was about a fifteen minute uh, uh, spot in between the first attack and the second attack, and so they were different kind of planes, but. Uh, uh, what happened is the uh, where everybody's wondering now what happened there, and, and we only and our people only shot down I think about six planes in that first attack. What what time did you see the first planes coming through? About uh, almost eight o'clock. Okay. Yeah. First, so, it was, yeah, it was almost eight o'clock because there was some, uh, and then then of course they attacked, 
and did a lot of damage. And uh, we were <coughs> we were at attacked. We had two planes come at us, but they were flying in formation like this, uh, and uh, and were the, a target in the middle. And I heard that they had 15 and 16 year old pilots in there. Later on, we found out, and some, and they had never figured out what the. the uh, I went to a thing where they studied the mistake they made. It was bombing Pearl Harbor to begin with, but the mistakes they made. They had planes coming in from all four directions, but they didn't tell them which way to peel off. So they were in danger of crashing into one another. Oh. And they, we had these two planes flying at us. They're coming in like this. And of course, our ship's only uh, 40, it's about 30 some feet wide. Is it four or is it 42 feet wide? At the, way to, way, at the widest point. And then it narrows down to nothing. Mm -hmm. And of course, they came flying over and they were flying in formation. And so they have to keep. Uh, far apart so they don't crash, their wingtips don't touch. So when they dropped their bombs, they each dropped a 500-pound bomb is what they figured they were. They landed not on the ship, but one on one side of the ship and one on the other side of the ship. And the ship went up a little bit, but it didn't do any damage. <laughs> we thought we had it for sure when we saw them coming. Well, that was as close to the call. And there, we were getting more damage from the uh, our own uh, 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 -aircraft. And the aircraft stuff was coming down on top. So, see, the Japanese never bombed uh, the city, no. but a lot of our uh, there were some sixty-five civilians killed, but a lot of our uh, sh shells from the battleships didn't go off, and they went into into the where the c civilians were. So there was some friendly fire there. But I don't know how many. Uh, but they never machine gunned or bombed the uh, city itself. They just were after us. So now, when when you had the when you uh, damaged and subsequently killed the sub, where did you guys go after that? Were you just still we're stuck still, in the still 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 in that the, same in the same area doing the figure eights? Yeah, we're back to just doing that again because, uh, and of course, the mine you have to minesweepers are out there too, <laughs> and we're thinking we're out here on patrol and there's. They think there's mines out here, you know, and <laughs> we but that's what we didn't think of giving much thought at that because of the planes or everything. But yeah, the uh, when did it hit you that this was real? Well, uh, when they when they, when they start dropping the bombs, and of course that was, we knew there was something wrong going on there. And then there there was a, a group of uh, our uh, air air force. Uh, came with some B-17s were coming from the States and they were coming in about the same time as the Japanese came in. And so when, when they got, when we were, they were report, when the radar was reporting a lot of these planes coming, we were expecting our own, own planes to show up. Okay. And our own planes had no guns on them because, uh, or ammunition, because they wanted, to, they were flying from California and they wanted to keep the weight down, so they had no ammunition, no guns. And we were still peacetime then. Yeah, of course. And then they, and our radio man on our ship, he picked up the uh, one of the planes' uh, radios, and they're asking, "What's going on down there?" They said, well, "Don't come down here. Don't land at Hickam Field. Whatever you do, don't land at Hickam Field. Go someplace else." And most of them did, but one did go down, and they got all shot to pieces. But uh, they went to different islands and landed at golf courses and every place else. They had a mess, really had a mess there. While all this was going on, what else did you see? I mean, you, I'm sure you were, you probably had a really keen focus, but can you just bring us through what, what was going through your eyes at that time? Well, just watching all those planes, we just see them flying all right over, you know, it, it couldn't. Gee, too bad we couldn't shoot them down because it was so it would have been so easily if we'd had twenty millimeters. And then we put ten ten of them on there afterwards, uh, after when they rebuilt the ship again. But uh, we were so you've never felt so helpless in your life. You're sitting at your gun, 
with doing what you're supposed to do, but not, nobody to shoot at because nobody would get down in your target area. So you feel pretty helpless, and you just you're just wondering. I don't know. You you don't seem to be afraid. You just seem more. Well, why can't I do something? I couldn't do anything. That was our problem. What did you see going on in the harbor? Well, we couldn't see too much in the harbor. Uh, uh, we knew the we knew the uh, smoke, the smoke from the burning there put out a plume of smoke that just covered the whole thing. You know, I never saw so much smoke in my life and all that burning of those ships and that. And of course, we're wondering what's going on now. We we're getting uh, things on our. Our, our sound gear that we're getting soundings on, but we got a World War One equipment, and that, that stuff would give us soundings on fish and st uh, schools of fish. We couldn't tell the difference, I guess, is what they tell me. I don't know that much about it, but uh, we dropped. Uh, I think it was 800, over 800. Uh, was it 800? No, oh, well, it was 80, 80, 88 depth charges on soundings, and we thought we had Japanese. We thought we had. We didn't know Japanese. We didn't know who they were until we saw the round circle on their planes. But we were getting soundings from there. But we were, we were killing a lot of fish too. Is what was happening. Uh, wow. So we felt it just. You just you know, what, what's going on? You know, <laughs> we're getting killed here. <laughs> Who are they? Well, they, we found out they were Japanese once we could see the uh, red circle on their planes. But we up until that time we didn't know, and they were more prepared for them when they came back. The second wave, they lost twenty twenty some planes there. I got because we had uh, there were some pilots that. We had some pilots that came from some remote airfields, okay. and they came. A couple of pilots came in, and they shot down. Uh, I think a couple of pilots there shot down seven of their planes, but I think they lost 28 planes in the second, uh, something like that. Uh, and in fact, is I got a sheet of paper that tells you what the what the casualty rates were on both sides. So now, that after the second wave, they pretty much cleared out. And the whole harbor was filled with smoke. Then what what happened with the war? I mean, what what was your next? Well, we had to go in and get some more depth charges. So about eleven o'clock in the morning, we went into Pearl Harbor, and uh, we didn't go. We could see what was going on, and we thought, boy, this is really bad. But we the uh, the ammunition depot is in uh, like here's where all the battleships are lined up. The ammunition depot is over here in the place. So we went over there and picked up those depth charges and uh, and uh, then we went right back out on patrol again. So, but they were worried. Uh, they wanted, they they <coughs> they were worried somebody would get sunk in that harbor, and then block it off. But there's uh, not a very very wide place, but it's not very long either. So you. It doesn't take long to get through there, but if you sunk a battleship in there, it'd probably make it tough to go in and out. It all depends on where they would sink it. Because uh, uh, one of the battleships got, uh, the Nevada got underway, and they, uh, they were told not to go out there because they were afraid to get sunk, so they ran aground on uh, what they call Hospital Point, and they ran aground there. And then they were later on. They were told to get off of there, and then they went back down a different place. And so, so that, uh, but they were told not to go in that channel because they didn't want anybody to get sunk. There. And they lost 54 men on there. From a there. friend of mine used to serve on the Nevada. Who was that? Uh, Ernie Matson. He was from Minneapolis. Ernie Matson. Uh, it doesn't sound uh, familiar. He was, he was but there I on know, December 7th. The, uh, Maybe I wonder if he belonged to our uh, when I was president of the Twin City chapter of Pearl Harbor survivors, uh, and uh, there were at <clears throat> at one time there were over uh, 500 Pearl Harbor su survivors that lived in uh, Minnesota, 
And it's a northern chapter, a southern chapter, and then our Twin City chapter. Okay. And we were split at one time. We had a St. Paul chapter and we had a Minneapolis chapter. And, but we would try to go to each other's thing. And they say, well, that's just silly. Well, we just get together because and, and, nobody wants to, to be the... the, the and I, of course, I was the youngest guy, so that's the reason I'm uh, still here. All the other guys have died off, so... And there may still be some alive, but, but they're in such bad shape, I don't know about them. Yeah. But I know one other guy that... Uh, uh, he was on the Nevada, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, and he, he still lives in the suburb someplace. I can't remember exactly where. Do you remember his name? Oh, Walt is his first name, but I can't seem to get it. Well, anyhow, we had a great conversation uh, on, you know, in March when uh, Dick, Phil, and I uh, had a chance to speak. Um, but we bring you this today because we want to give you a historical retrospective of what happened, uh, and, you know, in that time in history and also to make sure that you had a chance to hear from a wonderful man. Uh, we're going to leave you today uh, with one last thing. It's a musical number by the Naval Academy Glee Club on the USS Arizona Memorial. And with that, we will see you next week. We have two guests next week, so be, too, be sure to join us.